Now I have to wait till I'm wired for sound. Well, the news of the last few days on the political and uh, government front has stirred up a lot of thought. And we are beginning to realize that things are gravely amiss. And uh, there seems to be no very clear solution as to how to correct the condition because the condition at the moment involves nearly every aspect of mortal civilization in this country and in other parts of the world. The world is deeply in trouble. And in the reason for this trouble has been a general failure to recognize that humanity has a responsibility for the planet on which it lives. We have considered life to be one grand opportunity to avoid trouble, and we have succeeded in getting ourselves into very serious trouble. Now, we like to think of uh, the future, but some of the best thoughts that we really have come from the past. And I think the remarks and thoughts of Plato on the problems of government very well taken. He said, any system of government that is end intended to be of value will work if it is honestly administered, if the facts of life are kept clear, if the individual realizes that he is surrounded by honorable people trying to help him or trying to maintain the culture to which he belongs, things will go fairly well, whatever you call this system. Lacking integrity, no system will go well. There is no possibility of making dishonesty a permanent virtue for the race. We are in a problem that we have to face. Now, one of the interesting thoughts that have come down to us from the past on this intriguing subject has been this simple statement. An individual is not born a citizen of his country because he happens to be physically born in that place. He is not a citizen by birth. He is a citizen by dedication. And in practically all of the religions of antiquity, and I think especially of the higher periods of Egyptian culture, the creation of citizenship was a rite and a ritual, usually performed when the young person was between 14 and 16 years old. He was committed by himself and was old enough to know what that commitment meant and how he was part of a larger collective pattern. When he was about 14, 15 years old, he or she, either one, had the child lock cut off their hair. Up to that time, they were regarded as innocent little children without sense enough to decide anything of importance. But when they reached about 15 or 16, they had to begin to think about the world in which they lived, their duty to it, what would do for them, and what they must do for it. Now, there was an elaborate ritual in connection with this type of recognition. The individual did not simply stand up and recite a constitution or a declaration of independence. He was tested mentally, morally, emotionally, physically as to whether or not he had the stamina, the integrity, and the self-control appropriate to citizenship in a major world power. He had to proclaim his own citizenship and prove it. And he had to prove it by many different types of possibilities. Supposing he was trying to prove it today, he probably might be given a question such as, what is democracy? He wouldn't be asked to repeat the Constitution or pledge allegiance to the flag. He would be asked to show what he knows about a democratic system of life, how it can work, why it can work, and what can destroy it. He is expected to be, therefore, informed on the basic principles of government. 
Now this seems to be perhaps a rather exaggerated condition, but we are in an exaggerated crisis. Suppose we recognize the possibility of the graduation from high school could be the separation between the young and the mature. At the time of graduation from high school, the problem of establishing citizenship could be clearly defined. Now, a person would not have to declare citizenship simply because he was born in the country. He could live here, work, have a good job, and take care of his family, and never be a citizen according to the ancient rules. These rules were for persons who wished to become important factors in the world in which they lived. Citizenship gave sharing in the responsibilities duties and problems of government. Up to that time, the individual could well live in freedom, could be considered a perfectly normal citizen, but he would not vote on any issue of any kind. He would not pass rules on laws or take part in litigations concerning the government. He would not have anything to do with taxes or income or expenses. He would simply be living in whatever government existed at that time. If he wished to become a conscious member of a government, then he had to take the necessary tests. Now, for us, we probably wouldn't ask him to have tattoo marks put on his face at great pain to his, himself, nor would we ask him to run a hundred yards or something over rough rocks to prove his stamina. What we would be more likely to do now would be to try to educate him for citizenship if he wants it. And this education should begin in the kindergarten. He should begin by learning how to get along with other children six or seven years old. As he goes along, every year of his study would include at least one major field of government. He would be taught from the beginning how a country is governed. And if he lives in a democracy, he would learn from the beginning the principles of democracy, its dangers, its advantages, its disadvantages, and how he could become an active member in making a contribution to the improvement of the system which he had accepted as right. If the young person reached 16 with a thorough knowledge of the working of government, we have quite a different proposition than what we have now. We would recognize the importance of these values. We would also learn from the ancients, the Egyptians and the Greeks, that anyone who has attained citizenship and then performs corrupt actions is deprived of his citizenship. That he is no longer permitted uh, to become a citizen of a country if he is in any way contributed to the corruption of that country. It is his necessity to keep on the right side of facts, of truth, and of principles. And a person without principles and without integrity could not pass the examination and test for citizenship. He has to have character endorsed by the community he lived in, guaranteed by the teachers who assisted his childhood, by his family, by the community government, and by the neighbors, that he was a person or she was a person of integrity, honesty, and honor, kind-hearted, well-intentioned, and sincerely willing to work for the common good. If this test could not be passed, no citizenship. And their citizenship then became an honor, not something to be used, abused, and, uh, and uh, deceived. Citizenship was a distinction, and those who were citizens not only were expected to prove it every day, but gained a certain distinction for having us accepted un without qualification the responsibility of being a constructive member of the commonwealth. Now this is one way in which the ancients took hold of it. They made it very obvious and very evident that if you wish to be respected, and if you wish to contribute to the endurance of a system, you would have to live according to the rules. And any loss of these rules would deprive you of citizenship, 
And in growing up, you had not shown character, you would not be given citizenship in the first place. Now, this seems a rather strenuous method to approach something, but I think it has one rather simple phase that we could all benefit to, and that is the principles of government should be taught it to all school children. It should not be reserved for the uh, few, but anyone who is supposed to vote for a government should know what it is, what its pitfalls are, how it can be corrupted, how it has been corrupted, and how it can be preserved. The child should have this growing up. Otherwise, we are going to have this continual indifference at the polls, with no one really caring very much who gets elected or who is qualified. It is only in, by having a proper system to determine character that at least we will try to place the government of a nation in the keeping of its most responsible citizens not just anyone who comes along with the price of publicity. Now this begins something, but we can't stop here. The next question that arises naturally is, who is qualified to be a leader? How are we going to distinguish a proper candidate for a high office? We don't know it, we don't know them, we never will know them personally, most of us. We have no idea except they, what they say about themselves, and very often this is de definitely proven to be uh, an unreasonable way of selecting candidates. The next thing that then would be to remember that we are now graduating high school students who have majored in government. You say it's on the high school level. Some will say, well, uh, why, why, how can we do this? They're burdened already. Well, we could cut down on the athletics a little bit and get back into citizenship which is going to be much more valuable for all concerned. But the young person who graduates from high school can, and may by the time he graduates, have decided a little bit about his own future. Let us imagine that of his own accord, of his own discretion, while not yet a citizen, he has decided that he wants to be a citizen and that he wishes to become part of a corrected and enlightened government. All right, the next thing is, that we should be the proper higher educational facilities, not only available to him, but within his means financially, and also uh, within the understanding and conception that he has of life. In other words, if he graduates to be a major in government, he should make government a life work, a career. If he wants to be a banker, he can study banking. If he wants to be a physician, he can go to medical school. If he wants to be a lawyer, he can go to a legal institution. If he wants to be a member of a democratic government, he can go and take the necessary educational steps in a college or university of government. There should be a complete curriculum for a career, for a dedication, for a life work, in which the individual gains his degrees and recognition in a school dedicated to the production of governmental personalities. He should be in a school that makes ambassadors, secretaries, mayors, governors, senators, congressmen, all these things should be part of the career of a person who has chosen government as a life work. The problem that we have of trying to elect lawyers most of the time is not very successful. And the individual voting for the average person has no way of judging their true fitness or their true abilities. If a candidate is advanced as having a superior record in a school of accrediting government, government employees, he has at least some confidence that, he knew, that these people know what they're doing. Having decided that this such a, a such an institution as this should exist, it becomes obvious that the career of becoming a part of democracy should begin early in life and should continue on, and its greatest responsibilities rest upon the level of integrities and all of these examples which will strengthen the principles of a free and independent nation. These things will have to be thought through in some way. Now, if from out of this particular situation someone is graduated, he then can begin 
to recognize that government is financially not a political institution. Government is basically big business. It is a, an institution just exactly like any other powerful business organization. It is run and should, or should be run by trained persons in every field who should be appointed as people are today when they made vice president of a bank. They pro probably will hold that position for the rest of their lives. But they should be made to become part of the administration of government as a well-regulated business organization capable of controlling and directing the resources of the country with sufficient backing and stamina and proper intelligent membership to prevent the exploitation of the public purse, the government should be in the hands of an equitable, honorable business institution, graduated in government, dedicated to the service of the nation, and dedicated to the protection of all of the necessities of national life. There is no possibility of getting this situation untangled unless we are able to put it on a solid basis, free from exploitation, uh, free from ulterior motives, and free from all kinds of political subterfuge. This is something that has to be, or we will never be able to get the situation under control. Once we do create, however, a government system, as we would a bank or a great monopoly or a great business organization, then we have the matter of promotions. Individuals in various levels of this system would be advanced according to their abilities and according to the openings made by retiring superiors. They would do exactly the same thing that is done in business. They might start as a district alderman and they might end up as a secretary of state. They would do whatever the skills that they possess entitle them to promotion for a life career. They are not going to move out of the unknown for four or eight years and then disappear again and open a library. They're going to be here for the length of their business career. They're going to start with what they can get into at the beginning, the vacancies as you find in business, and they're going to work up on a merit system until they reach whatever height their capacities permit. They will then remain in business, maintaining their positions, helping to train others to follow them until retirement. Then they will retire under a definite pension in the same way as a business executive. Also, because of the fact that this is their home, their government, their institution, exists for them, permits them to live in a free world, and to have the advantages and privileges of a democratic viewpoint on life, these men or women or both will work for these governmental positions on reasonable salary basis. No one expects the person to live on nothing, but there's no reason why every politician should aim or hope to be a multimillionaire. This is not for the country's good, but for his own. A politician serves his own purposes, a statesman serves his country. And the difference must be clearly indicated, or we're going to be in more trouble than we know what to do with. But if we do develop an institution suitable to produce a, a proper uh, escalated system of promotions, each individual advancing according to his capacities and his dedications, each person helping those above and below with no personal ambitions other than the natural and honorable progressions that occur in a well-regulated business organization. If this is done and done properly, and it carries with it the distinction that it indicates clearly that the person is a, an honorable, dedicated citizen, this in itself is an honor almost equal to an honored degree in some foreign country. It is a sign of a true American citizen. And this is the thing that we're going to have to have or do something with. Now this produces another situation. No country can today exist alone. We are part of a world of nations, some of them so small that they appear to be ridiculous, 
and some so vast it becomes completely unwieldy. But all of these countries have relationships with us and we have relationships with them. And we are no longer be able to afford a relationship with other countries sustained and supported by nuclear armament or by treaties that are broken as quickly as they are made. This whole situation calls for another step above what we have now. And that other and next higher step is the world nation. It is that all the nations of the earth, like all the states of a union, are brought, brought together in a, one grand over pattern, a pattern in which all are part of a brotherhood, a part of a democracy, part of a commonwealth. Whatever they wish to con control or do within their boundaries must also be ethical, and a nation can be thrown out as easily as a citizen can be cast out for delinquency. There should be a world government. There should be an independent head selected from the governments of the world. This individual should have been through all the steps of government. No politician, no one picked out of nowhere, no one saw a previous college professor, newspaper editor, or legal light of some kind. Anyone occupying a serious position anywhere in the pattern must have grown up through a a, tra a special training, a definite program of preparation for leadership. And these various levels of leadership will elect from among themselves those whom they regard as most likely uh, to be valuable to the corporation or to the business. We will find out of that very shortly uh, that a large part of our corruption will completely cease. There is no need for us to constantly worry about this situation if we would for once in our lives finally decide that the best answer is honesty. This is something we're frightened to death might be true. And the many of the things that we most cherish in our daily life come to us through shady meetings, which we shall have to learn to get over. Now we have another set of problems that we coming in on us. And the environmentalists are already hard at work on those. And that is what we are doing with the planet itself. One of the main things that we have got to learn here is that this planet is not big enough, strong enough, or powerful enough uh, to permit it to be used constantly for competitive purposes. There is no room for competition in a small planet. We are a relatively small planet. We are also a p poorly managed one and we are one in which waste has become the order of life. We are here not for the benefit of the future, but for the gratification of the present. This planet cannot and will not go on the way it is, and the only way to get rid of the problems of the planet is to get an honest government, because without that the changes necessary in conduct and in business relationships and in interplanetary use of natural resources cannot be estimated. So we have a planet of very limited resources. I have mentioned on other occasions that this planet is like an alchemical bottle. It is a bottle, and it has only so much in it. And if this bottle is empty, there is no knowing what the future could be. We might suddenly realize that we are heading to join those dead moons that still circle here and there in space. We cannot exhaust the resources of the planet and survive. And the uh, environmentalists can prove beyond any question that we are wasting these resources every day. And every day is therefore taking more than a day off of the life expectancy of the planet itself. We are not concerned with the, th with the projects which will preserve and protect the resources of the country. We are already faced with nuclear waste that we do not know what to do with. We are faced with constant diminishing uh, resources of all kinds, and there has to be some definite plan that is larger than the selfish exploitations of separate countries, by the uniting of which, under one general heading, we can extend these resources as far as possible and furthermore gain in this way 
further time in which to seek for other and better solutions. We are heading in an absolutely death-bent course at the moment. Every resource we have, except wood, practically cannot be uh, replaced. We are constantly using up the life of the planet. We are corrupting the atmosphere, polluting the water. We are continuing the use of various nuclear products for which we have no understanding. We have no way of knowing what we are doing. The only rule of the whole thing is the rule of money. As long as profits are possible, tomorrow is, uh, is of no consequence. But in the problem of government, we must have also the conservation of all natural resources. We must find ways of stretching commodities as far as possible. We must save and conserve much that we now waste every day. We must conserve replacements wherever possible, whereas today the sale is buy a new one. Everything is wasteful because waste is profit. But the profit of business is the loss of the world, and we can hardly wait to see something change this before it is completely too late. Now, in the same general phase as, as this particular situation, we have the very serious and uh, definitely dangerous factor of the pollution of atmospheres and of the misuse of the natural atomic resources of the planet. We are mine on, mining out of the planet its very life. We are doing what we might do if we gave a person a tremendous uh, bloodletting, that we are trying desperately to get another transfusion into our industry from the planet. These transfusions are exhausting the planet, and we are beginning to see in, in scientific calculations the gradual increase of destructive factors, the breaking down of the resources of the planet with the possibility uh, that we will all end in a completely debilitated, uh, dead planet. This is something we don't want to look forward to. It is quite possible that something can be done to assist many of these things. But we have got to begin to use common sense over profit, or we're going to be in trouble. One of our latest additions to the list of difficulties is now the computer. We are on the face of a great change, which could be for the better, but is more likely to be for the worst. It is now a possible, by means of a computer, for the complete control of the world to be ultimately vested in one or two persons. This is a very dangerous state of affairs, because it can ultimately end in a complete tyranny, the dictatorship and of the past of Alexander and Napoleon and Hitler actually achieved by means of a little instrument that sits on a table. Unless we use these various advancements with discretion, with discrimination and with integrity, and we've got to go back to the public school again and get integrity back into the, school, into the schoolroom where it belongs. We cannot cure the world's problem unless we can create generations of honest people. We cannot create generations of honest people while the rewards all go to the dishonest. And that uh, competition is regarded as the life of trade. It is not the life of anything. It is the destroyer of everything that is important in human nature. So we finally go to the next step of the situation, and that is currency, money. This is a very delicate situation. But I think we can say probably that money is the primary root of all the other evils. Money or profit of some kind, wealth, is probably the dominating motivation behind cupidity and crime. There are other secondary motives, some of them pretty, pretty important, but wealth and profit are the things which are at the present time endangering the survival of all of us. We are living on a profit system. We are trying to live off the interest on our debts. We are striving desperately to create a stable currency in a world in which the only enduring value is moral value, and we don't have that. 
Therefore, money is a misery and a misfortune unless integrity administers it. And we come right back again to the problems of integrity. These are the problems which include uh, nuclear warfare, include all forms of competition and monopoly, all kinds of uh, rebellions, revolutions, and anarchies. The problem, therefore, goes right back to the fact that we cannot live together in a complicated civilization without proper training, understanding, and dedication. Without these things, it is not going to be solved. And if it is much longer unsolved, we will have nothing to solve it with. It is really very, very serious at this time to bear up that the coming generation that must go into the new century must go in with a different basic concept of life. We've got to train young people not to continue to make our mistakes, but at least make some original ones of their own. We cannot keep on passing on the mistakes of the past to an unborn generation and expect anything to survive. So we go back to the problem of education, of integrity, and also the problem of preparing for a new century. We will find that nearly all of the corruptions of our generations, social corruptions, narcotics, things of this nature, all are arising from a desperate, desperate uh, depression, a loss of hope, a loss of conviction of anything, a loss of belief in any integrity. A simple problem is be as comfortable as you can in a miserable situation. Do what you want to as long as you can because pretty soon you won't be able to do anything. Well, this is no kind of a foundation upon which to build a new generation, a new civilization, or a new world culture. We've got to clean house in the years that remain. And the only place we can do it is to start, certainly, with the public school system. We can start by immediately incorporating into the schooling ethics, morality, and integrity. We have allowed moral values to decline. We have allowed the uh, teachings of the great minds of the past to be ignored or corrupted or misinterpreted. We have tried desperately to be a materialistic generation and have failed utterly because materialism is itself a dismal failure. Therefore, it is very, very necessary, if we want to go into the next century, to get to work now to clean house as much as we can. Now, in doing so, there are certain personal things that we can do if we want to. They may not at the moment seem terribly helpful, but if individuals come in sufficient number, they can change, change the course of destiny. The individual can try in every way possible to clean his own house, to make sure that his own relationships with life have integrity. He can modify his desires to keep track of the availability resources that he has. He can keep out of debt. He can escape the pressures of luxury. He can avoid entertainment that will corrupt him and his children. He can begin to be an honest person himself in those little things which can make up a great decision in the long run. One of the things that must be done is to strengthen the homes of the American people. When the home goes, we're gone, and it is weakening seriously. Confucius was the author of the famous statement, as goes the family, so goes the nation, and as so goes the nation, so goes the world. We are losing the sense of, fa of, fa of family, we are losing loyalties, we are losing mutual consideration and support, we are emphasizing the desirability of infinite individualism. Each person wishes to do exactly as he pleases. He wishes to be free of all responsibilities, and in so doing, he is gradually going to be free from the responsibilities of a nation. The nation goes when he does not support it. As long as we ignore the burden of maintenance, we will find the world falling apart around us. We have to make these decisions. And for most people, the decision of bringing up younger people with a vision of the future is something that almost any family in the country can work with. 
but they have to set the example they have to understand they have to inspire and they must prove to all beyond all doubt to their children that the family and the home are the better way <coughs> the way of greatest security the way of greatest happiness and the way of greatest fulfillment all these things must be part of a proper understanding of home as the home disappears we are going to find more and more broken down disappointed disillusioned people nearly every person who is at the present time antisocial has been hurt in some way by the calamities of our civilization they have been hurt by a world which lacks all the graces that we assumed we possessed it's very possible that the last century was a little smug we'll all agree to that but at least it was loyal uh, lo loyalty to the family loyalty to the community all these were the great virtues today they are completely forgotten forgotten we are loyal only to our own ambitions and appetites we are also f overlooking the effects of our mistakes upon our psychological integration we are about 260 or 70 million Americans who are living under situations tensions and pressures that are bound to deplete health and depress the psychological integration <clears throat> in other words we are becoming a race of neurotics we are becoming a race of disillusioned individuals who have lost faith in our world and lost faith in ourselves and are trying to take it out on narcotics or alcohol this is not right basically the country is better than that our world is better than that but we do not give the better part of it a chance now there's one thing we can all do and that is make it a personal responsibility to contribute as little as possible to the mistakes of society we can try to live as clean and clear and right as possible we can try to build a strong ethical relationship with life now we are bound to know that honesty is going to bring a lot of business to, to bankruptcy because it is built on dishonesty almost anything we do that's right is going to bring down an empire it is going to bring down the empire of those who have exploited us and each other particularly in the last century but it still has to be done it is better for a, an era to go down than a world to cease now how are we going to handle some of these very delicate issues that we have for instance in connection with morality and ethics in the public school I think we must face the very simple fact that it is no longer something that we have to face it is something that we can demand and secure by parents themselves will require it if a sufficient number of parents want to see their children vote for better candidates and to see the community with better leadership they will support the involvement of uh, political or, st or uh, legislative uh, education in the school system now in this we also have pointed out more and more of integrity and the moment we come close to integrity we get into a mysterious and complicated religious situation actually efforts have been made to bring religious morality into the school system and they have all failed now they have failed probably because of the fact that it is already an obvious fact <coughs> that religion is an economic debit the ind religious individual is not going to do the things that the non-religious person will endure we are willing to cor be corrupted unless our religion is strong enough to straighten us out now religion must be involved in this in some way but it does not have to be involved theologically we have some remarks and thoughts concerning religion which we're saving for the next lecture of this series which will be the last of this but we are, are concerned with what we might term ethics a philosophy of ethics ethics has been taught to the world since the dawn of time every nation has had its ethical structures every nation has wandered away from its ethics and fallen every nation of the past no matter how strong it was has failed and died from internal corruption 
and therefore we have to be very careful that we don't follow that pattern that we do not permit the sins of the past to also grow and increase, increase here in our generation and civilization we have got to start in with something that can be accepted as basic integrity and the most precious and useful area in which this should be done is among the young young people have got to be brought around a little bit at least to the recognition of the responsibilities of citizenship I think this can be done I think a new patriotism can be strengthened by letting these young people realize that they're working on a job that is of vital importance they're not merely gathering around to have meetings and talk about something or to memorize a, something like the Constitution they are to be gathered to do things to make achievements to accomplish something and to prepare themselves to become uh, citizens of this country therefore if young people had the choice of earning citizenship by doing it right we'd find probably a very large group of young people who will move in that direction young people want to be important they want to be admired they want to be regarded as very valuable parts of the community and give them a job that is worthwhile let them do it and reward them for it by the recognition they hope for could very well start us off on an entirely new basis of relationships with each other our nation and our world I would say the most important thing we can do at this time is to get into circulation as much literature as we can dealing with the importance of a new standard of citizenship a citizenship which is of importance and is reserved for those who have earned it and uh, Albert Churchwood and his uh, rather important work on signs and symbols of primordial man uh, emphasizes this system in connection with uh, Central African native tribes we find it in the Southwest in the American Indian civilization we find it all over the world that the individual has to earn the right to be a part of his tribe and in the Southwest Indian group we have for instance vigil which was one of the most important of the American Indian mystical observations young men women starting out in life in their teens were supposed or expected to perform vigil the vigil consisted of going out at night into a quiet place in the mountains or in the desert placing the prayer flags upon the four corners of the world and sitting in quiet meditation whispering or munching under their breath only father show me the way the Indian way was the term to represent integrity show us the way show us what we should do show us how we can do it give us the blessing of the great spirit and these people sat quietly and meditated fathers show us the way and in the middle of the night or at some strange time the visions came perhaps the tired child fell asleep and dreamed but whatever it was something happened something showed the way in one case it came to directly to my attention one of these young men went out and for five nights he did vigil in the daytime but he was awake all night during the magic hours and on the seventh night he saw the thunderbird he saw it fly across the sky above him he knew he had the call he was to be a priest and it is from the vision of the Thunderbird that his life career was sent, set forth for him and from that time on the Thunderbird was his totem was the, the spirit of integrity that walked with him and very much of this is in the spirit of the old Greek and Egyptian and there was a connection between the American Indians and these peoples I know in the 1940s when I had Hostine Claw here they were probably the last of the great sand painters of the Navajo people I showed him the copy of my big book and we opened it to the page with the emerald tablet of Hermes and this old Indian who spoke no English but we used an interpreter who had never seen a written book to read it 
looked at this green tablet which we put in there and he turned to the translator who was Askenaswit and he said in very ancient times my people could have read that no one knew why he said it nothing more was said but uh, it was part of a recognition and among these things remembered and recognized was the idea of the priesthood show me the way and uh, in all of our life today young people before they start out in life should do some kind of a vigil they should do something that gets them away forever from the uh, um, past music and the decadence of our modern life way to simply recognize that we are all born for a purpose we are all born with something to do therefore we have a right to ask the great spirits father show me the way what am I supposed to do how can I fit myself to do it today these thoughts are not even in our minds and in these thoughts today we would be considered very foolish our present problem is to catch a few more rock, uh, rock music uh, programs on the TV until the neighborhood can hardly stand the racket this is the way we meet these things we have come completely separated from what the American Indian called the life way there is a life way and the old sachems sitting together knew about the way and the great league of the Iroquois nation said the beginning of the way is to spread the white carpet of the peace all people dwelling together in peace then we must build a roof great enough to be the roof over all nations and we say that this is the roof, the roof of the great lodge to which all belong that the world is a sacred place and they had their mysteries and their rites and their rituals and their ceremonies to prepare for citizenship and down in our southwest in Arizona we have strange little um, rows of pebbles uh, that were made mystic mazes and they were part of the symbolical religious ritualism of the, Ameri of the Arizonian Indians everywhere the individual quietly living in the desert or in the mountains close to nature wanted to help wanted to do something to advance the cause saw around him a great beauty a great integrity and a great purpose and then could only sit quietly and say show me the way and usually the way was shown something happened that turned that individual into a useful and helpful member of society when we forget the type of world we live in we are in very serious trouble when we do not recognize the mysteries of life around us and do not feel that we receive from life a challenge or an invitation or we recognize that we were born for a reason that well, regardless of the importance of the circumstances of our birth the life way is ours to do that which is necessary and proper today there is a great need to have someone or something say quietly show us the way because we have lost our way we have lost it in a maze of confusion and selfishness and criticism and unfriendliness we had a way that came to us from our religion we do not follow it we have ways that came to us from the ancient laws of our predecessors we do not obey them we have the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount but we pay no attention to it we live only for the gratification of appetites and ambitions this is wrong and it can never produce anything but disaster and we've got to do something about it and do that something pretty quick I went when I went uh, down in Santa Fe area <clears throat> I did vigil just to see what would happen and out there in the under a starlit sky was with the beauties of the night the moon, pale moon shining down it seemed so much that we were in a world that was beautiful kind gentle wise loving that there was a strange majesty about it it was great and yet it was infinitely tender 
and infinitely available to us then in the quiet moment of thought of the realization of this marvelous closeness to life we were suddenly reminded of the Mount Alamos nuclear project just a few miles from there here we had two worlds a natural world of beauty and a man-made world of hate of fear we didn't fear nature we feared each other we did not fear the wisdom of the past we feared the selfishness and the ignorance of the present and we saw no way out of this strange despotism that had captured us we've got to find a way out and one of the best ways we can possibly find is to get the young people started on a better foundation they've got to pick up something that we haven't given them we have gradually lost touch with our own children we have lost the realization that there is something that we are indebted to that it is our need our right our inevitable purpose to see that these young people fulfill a destiny we may not live to see but they will and we've got to find ways to make sure that they will have a better life for live when it comes now what are we going to do about money being that money is probably one of the biggest problems we have well we can do all kinds of possibilities some of which are pretty ridiculous but at the same time we can consider them all Moore in his utopia decided that money was useless unvaluable, un a non-valuable commodity that the only actual way of solving the whole problem was to set things up so that each individual's share in the common good was protected that there was no need for money this is something we can't understand but it is true that we have not been in trouble because of money we have been troubled by the profit system we have been troubled by the fact that money is supposed to make money that we do not want to work we want our money to work for us that we want to use the advantages of money without accepting its disadvantages well the distance the major disadvantage of money is corruption and it has never existed where it has not been corrupted it is therefore necessary to think of how to get the lure of wealth and the temptation of wealth out of the human pattern before it destroys us all we, uh, we ought to know being just simply human that when we go from here we can't take the money with us and very often we don't know what to do with it when we do leave it <clears throat> and the heirs we leave it to simply squander or dissipate it so the whole thing is very secondary sometime we're going to have to decide in ourselves for ourselves whether it is better to live comfortably and securely here or leave a fortune to be wasted by our descendants and this fortune incidentally apt to destroy them morally and ethically as it has destroyed us to accumulate it so that the whole theory of wealth is one of the enemies it is something that we have come to consider to be suitable to be achieved by any individual regardless of means honest or dishonest and there's no the only punishment is to be get is to be caught if we are not caught we can be dishonest for the whole of our lifetime now this business of money has always been a, a a sore point in the study of human life because it has always resulted in the veneration of the wealthy the veneration of those who are supported by wealth the, the extravagances of these people not only became the basis of our veneration for the people but ultimately our rebellion and revolution against these people money is one of the problems that needs to be reconstructed thoroughly in a human society we need some type of a medium or re a recognition that is not controlled by money probably the one of the simplest answers to the whole thing is the recognition that there is no way of buying or selling the planet or anything on it that this so-called selling is simply a, a at most a minor mortgage that we cannot hope ever to own the things that we are paying for they will either be broken and destroyed or they will return to their original owners therefore money as such is a convenience something to shake in your pocket but not something to build a philosophy of life on 
a philosophy of life must be built on something that cannot be corroded by profit. And one of the things that we can do is to take the profit out of the money and make it something that is entirely what it is intended to be, a medium of change. One of the simple ways of accomplishing this, but it will be very painful, is simply to stop forever the profit system on investment. That you cannot make money by simply letting somebody else borrow yours. That these types of things become the basis of inevitable corruption. That the answer is that under a well-regulated system, the money factor is not necessary. There is no need for money in Moore's Utopia. Yet it was supposed to be a country the size of France with many thousand people. It was not necessary to have money because everything that was necessary belonged to the people in the beginning. Everything we need for proper life is ours. Everything we need for waste will be condemned. Everything that we gain by taking from someone else who cannot afford to lose it will no longer function as a factor. We can all have everything that is necessary to our survival and a moderate income without the vast financing system uh, that we have now. Why do we have to have great taxes? Well, one thing is for munitions and armament. Once we start hating each other, there goes that part of the investment. And when we hate each other, what do we do? Waste more natural resources and hasten the time when the whole planet will be barren. So we do not need these types of things. We do not need the great monopolies that arise. The fifty and hundred billion dollar takeovers are quite unnecessary. We were just as happy in the long run with a country store and an old-fashioned friend who was a farmer. We do not need all these things. Everything that we need is available to us. If we do our share of the labor of production, we must do it and be all properly employed, helping to maintain the integrities of each other, the necess necessities of each other, the services that are required by each other. This problem of thousands of dollars for an operation, millions of dollars for a lawsuit, all these things are based upon an entirely false way of life. And if we keep on nursing it, we're going to have nothing at all in the end but dead planet because we are slowly taking the life out of it to pay the bills we should never have made in the first place. All these things bring us another problem. How about building back where we can natural resources that have been wasted or squandered? Can we plant more trees? We're trying to. Can we do various ways of conserving the resources that we have? Can we stop creating luxuries that we can't afford and all this type of thing? Now, nature steps in and gives us some very useful information. We must be able to see it because it's right outside our window. And one of the things we notice here is that it's gradually reaching a point where all this motivation of vehicle travel is obsolete. We can't travel by any system we know today. Everything in a few years will be completely stopped by congestion and the constant flowing of these cars and things into the markets where there's no place to drive them after you get them. This is a, a serious problem. There are t places in the world now where it takes two hours to go ten blocks. And pretty soon it'll take four hours to go ten blocks. And uh, then a little later, ten blocks will be an annual vacation. We will never get there. <laughs> Now, we, we keep right on doing it. How can, can we wait till the next model comes out? So we have to have it. We're all geared up to the fact that we have something rattling in our pockets and we have to get rid of it. So we just add to this problem day by day until everything we do and have is immovable. We have lost track of common sense. We have lost track of thinking anything through. The only thing we are concerned with is the gratification of a moving mood. And then we look it over carefully, and we ask people questions, and we get very strange answers. Suddenly we realize that the average individual has no understanding whatever of human society. He has no understanding whatever of what a democracy is. All he can answer is that it's different from an autocracy. 
But he's wrong on that too. It can be just as autocratic as any other form of government. We do not like royalty, but we tolerate dictators. We do not like dictators, but we uh, tolerate uh, long-term administrators who have been filling their pockets with our possessions. We do not think. We allow these things to move in on us until finally we are going to have an impassable situation. Now we're going to have it with everything. The entertainment field is corrupted beyond words for money. Half the books that are published are not fit to read. They're printed because the worse they are, the better they sell. <laughs> we also know that in the course of time, the cost of every service that we need is going to be higher than it is today, and the service will be poorer. All these things nobody pays any attention to. But there are ways in which each of us can tighten up a little bit. And if enough people tighten up, major changes can and will take place. We have now a really powerful move on the part of environmentalists who are going to get into the act very shortly. I see by a newspaper clipping that the National Geographic magazine in its next issue is going to show a crystal earth on its cover shattered by a bullet. Now this uh, sounds as though they mean something. This is the result of being gradually fed up with things that are wrong and should never have occurred. They have occurred. Now we've got to get out of it before it gets us. Uh, it means we're going to have to do for ourselves what we have refused to accept from anybody else, and that is self-discipline. The uh, laws of antiquity were administered to a society that believed in laws. Those laws today are being administered to a society that does not believe in laws. Therefore, it's going to have to have the law without the believing. It's going to have to face the problems head on and accept the consequences that have come from uh, our centuries of corruption and misuse of natural resources. We have to do these things. We want to get into the 21st century. We want to do things to make a better world for all of us. And we're going to have to, each person can get at it with something. If we get at it with children, it will help. If the school won't do it, we may have to. But the school will do it if enough parents want it. But to make parents want it, they've got to realize that they're suffering for lack of it, whether they realize it or not. And the average family has children today that are problems. And they will get to be bigger problems unless parents solve the problems with the children. We're going to have to work together to put the world together again and realize that the material which can save it is the material in our own souls. It has to be saved for by within ourselves, becoming aware of the need for a reestablishment of the integrities and values which are slowly fading away. The truths we need are inside of ourselves. They cannot be taken away from us, but they can be left dormant unless we bring them out into manifestation. It is up to us to take the truth that we know in our hearts and souls and start using them in our daily lives. And every person has a small circle of acquaintances and friends. We all know people. We all have relatives and friends. And these we can share a little of our hope for better things. Some will laugh at it, but some who are in trouble themselves will listen attentively. There is going to be a major change in the public attitude towards many things that are now well out of control. As publicity, propaganda, and evidence accumulates that we are being viciously mistreated, that we are being exploited in the name of progress, the uh, private citizens are very apt to show that the patriotism that we need is still inside, ready to come out, if we'll do anything with it. In the meantime, I do think that the final word is education in this particular field. The word education from educo means to draw out, to bring forth out of things, whereas we've been using it to cram in a sterile curriculum. What we need to know now is to be educated in the facts of life, educated in the problems that we will all have to face, 
education and moral personal convictions that we must all develop and strengthen. The time has come when people have got to grow. The, the world around us can't grow. It has a physical limitation of the planet cannot grow any more than uh, the other planets and stars. Society will not grow because its profit lies where it is even though it is short-ranged and dangerous. The growth must come from the fact that each one of us has locked within its own, his own soul a, a divine reality. Every one of us knows, if we go deeply enough, that there is an integrity at the base of existence, that all things are measured by honor and honesty, and that all corruption is a false interpretation of some valuable principle or purpose. So the truth must come from within to combat the untruth that is pushed against us from the outside. We live in a world of doubts and uncertainties, but we have to realize that the only world of certainties is within our own souls, that we have the power to build worlds. We have the wisdom to govern them. We have the divine right to inherit the earth in good condition and pass it on to our descendants as a place of happiness, usefulness, and security for centuries and thousands of years to come. We have these potentials. We have these rights. But if we do not use them, we are very, very likely to lose them. All of the extravagances of destruction are now too expensive. We cannot afford the continuing bankruptcies, the huge piling up of national debts, international chicanery. These things we can no longer endure. And uh, wherever the opportunity comes for this private citizen to express his convictions on these matters, he is morally obligated to do so. If we can get this kind of realization and get behind it several well-organized groups that are already working on it, I think we will be able to make a major dent, particularly at first in the environment problem. And the environment gets to be very important because the environment is not only the planet, but it's the food we eat. It is the sky over our heads. It is the house we live in. Environment is the envi neighborhood which we call the planet. And it has certain limitations and restrictions. We know that the, the people that live in this environment want to eat. They want to have clothes. Uh, they want to have medical help. They want to have schooling. And they want to enjoy uh, certain comforts in their advancing years. These things are all necessary to the security of our generation and our race. All of these things are now deeply threatened. And out of this threat, somebody has to think straight. I don't believe that it is all the fault of legislators. It is not all the fault of the pers persons we appoint to office. It's my mistake because we often appoint people who are, might be perfectly sincere but incapable of handling the situation. We must be able to therefore know what type of person we need for a certain spot to make this a successful self-governing country. And that's why we need to and must have a, a, a university of government where we will be able to produce people who are aware and equipped and can provide the necessary information and do it without ulterior motive. We've got to pass uh, the administration of the planet on to professionals instead of leaving it as it is at the present time in the hands of amateurs. We do not know how to elect because we do not know who possesses the necessary characteristics. Nobody knows. And in most cases, when we elect a man to public office, we doom him to tragedy. He will be corrupted or will be unable to handle the situation. So we've got to get out of this inability of situation where we're not able to do anything and realize that no democracy can function unless each one of its citizens knows what it's all about. That if we want to last as a nation or part of an enduring world, we must know why we are here, what we can do, how we can do it, and how we can help other nations to also achieve the maturity of their proper existences. These things all have to happen. We're getting very close to the desperate need for the great big brotherhood of man. We're going to have to have it. 
we can no longer maintain the Hitlers and the Mussolinis and the Alexanders. We are in a world now where survival is only possible through cooperation. And, and in personal and family life, survival is only possible by the neighborhood cooperating, by the family cooperating with its own members, and by all in turn working together in the light of what they know to help to bring about the good things that they need and what we all need. And most of all, perhaps, that in every family the training of children should be the most important single consideration, a importance which we cannot overestimate. So I think we can say that politics cannot be solved by amateurs. We are going to have to establish a system of education to produce the statesmen that we need. We do not need politicians. We need statesmen. We need persons trained who are in the office and are supported by those also trained who recognize superiority when they see it. We need to put this whole thing on a thoroughly business basis, but we need it to be a business administered by idealists. We need the education of these idealists from the, the kindergarten on up to the realization that statesmanship is a dedication and not an opportunity to exploit. We must help everyone we can to become aware that the world in which we live is all our responsibility. In each way, each day, there's some little thing we can do to help make these things work out. We have to get started in the right direction, back movements and principles and policies that we know are working in the right direction, sacrifice a little of our own comfort and a little of our own security if necessary to help to bring about the greatest security of the entire world. Well, that's the way it looks to me.